parents, uh, Joseph and Mary, and God, how God had protected them in ways that were really, really were miraculous ways in, in how they managed to escape harm uh, and, and be safe through all of that. And Matthew is very clear, like, much like Luke 2, in communicating, in their communicating of Jesus' birth. Uh, well, it's like ours uh, in one biological sense, I suppose, but his birth was supernatural in that he was conceived supernaturally. And the story of Jesus is, is God becoming flesh and becoming human, living as a human. And Matthew sets out to clearly identify Jesus as God's son, as the Messiah who is to come to the world. And, and, uh, and of whom um, ancient, the ancient prophecies had, had written of and had spoken of. And, and in John chapter 1, we find Jesus, he, he comes to the shores of the Jordan, where he is baptized by John the Baptist. And there were two people who were standing next to John uh, the, after his baptism, uh, whether it was the day after or, or however that worked out. But there were two people standing alongside John the Baptist. One was Andrew, who would later become one of the 12 disciples of Christ. And then there was another. And as Jesus passed by, John says this, there he is, there is the Lamb of God. And immediately those two friends followed right in behind Jesus. And Jesus notices that they're following too. And these two are really curious men here. They are, they're filled with wonder. And Jesus, when he notices that he's being followed, he turns and he asks them, what is it that you're looking for? And they really don't know how to respond to that question. And it, would, it certainly seems that way because, and perhaps it's because of what John had said. You know, there is the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb of God. That's God's Son. That's the Messiah in the flesh right before their eyes. And through what they had experienced, through what had been witnessed of Jesus at his baptism, where there is this voice that had, that had come out of, like what seemed to be out of thin air that said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. And then something descends out of the sky that looked like a dove falling upon Jesus, and it's the very Spirit of God. You know what? That would have been quite a bit for, for anyone who was there to absorb. That was, that was a loaded experience. And when Jesus asked them as they're following in behind them, what, are, what do you want? What are you looking for? All they can really come up for in a reply is, well, where are you staying? And what is Jesus' response to that? Well, come. Come and you will see. And, and this invitation made to Andrew and his friend to go with Jesus, it, 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 we said this a couple weeks ago. It's not a mere invitation to come and check out his living accommodations, see what, what kind of a place he's at. It's an invitation that's made to them to come and to catch a glimpse of the immensity of God, where they would be given a window to peer through over and over again, where they would be eyewitnesses to the glory of God that would be displayed through an array of different things, through lame people walking, through, through sick and diseased people being made well again, and through the blind receiving sight, and through, the, through hungry people being fed. And they were even witness to people who had passed away, who had lost their lives. They were even witness to see those lives be restored to them, be given back to them. And all of this was for a purpose. And all that Jesus had allowed them to witness and allowed them to experience, all that he had showed them, it wasn't to wow them over and over again so that he would have to come up with yet another experience to kind of stoke their fire or for their entertainment value, but Jesus came to show them who God was and that they could know who God was too, that they could know him personally. And so Jesus invites them to come with him, to come and see. And he invites others to come and follow too. And the table is set before anyone who comes to be where they are invited to be, to be nurtured, to be filled, and to be satisfied. And now in Matthew chapter 5, that Philip had read for us just a few moments ago, written out for us is the Sermon on the Mount. And that sermon begins with the Beatitudes, 12 verses. And sermons are not easy things to put together. And I'm not just saying that, that, that because, you know, I'm a preacher and I want you to know that I work hard in putting these messages together and, you know, week after week. But they are difficult because everybody receives things differently as well. Now, beginning of the year here, beginning of January, some of you really like the history. You really like the maps. And, and I had some maps. And, and so all of you history, history people, that, that kind of connects with you. You like that. And you say, well, I like all the maps. I like that stuff. And then I have some that say, you know what? I really like those stories that you tell, those, those life stories or those personal stories. And they, they, I really like them. So you have the, all these things you're trying to work through. But the thing is this, is that I hope that sermons 
are not just content. And let me explain that. I think that a lot of preachers, what they hope and pray for is that an experience is created. I think we hope and we pray that something will happen and that something is not communicated just through words alone. And so with that in mind, what do the Beatitudes do? What do they do? Here they are, briefly again. Blessed are the poor, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The Beatitudes are spoken to the disciples, and, and they don't just remind the disciples that they are blessed. I think Jesus wants them to feel it. He wants them to feel that they are blessed as much as they know it. He wants them to feel it. And the Beatitudes, they're identifiers. They are identifiers of discipleship. They are they're attributes of believers. They are characteristics of the faithful. And they are truth-tellers that are as much for those 12 disciples, as much for us today as they were for those 12 disciples some 2,000 years ago. The Beatitudes name our blessings. And also, what is at stake in these blessings. And this is why this sermon is given by Jesus. The disciples have to know who they are in order or in, to, to be able to hear the rest of of what Jesus has to say about who he needs them to be. And perhaps the sermon, this is why the Sermon on the Mount is also important, why it's delivered so early on in his time with the disciples, right at the beginning of their time. Perhaps so that the Great Commission might actually come to fruition. You are blessed. The disciples had to hear that at the front end of their journey with Jesus. They had to hear that first. And we have to hear that in these words too. You are blessed. Believe it and feel it. And then in the verses that follow, that we'll read probably and discuss a little bit more next week, is you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And I think if we do not see that we are blessed, truly blessed, we will not be salt and we will not be light. And we will not see the gifts of blessings that are before us. That will be life givers for us as we journey through, this, through our time here on this earth. Which could also be life givers that we could pass on to those in our families or those around us. I think the greatest blessing that we see here, the greatest blessing is that, we, that we have been given is really the same as had been given to those two, those two men that were standing next to John the Baptist in John chapter 1. There goes the Lamb of God. And immediately those two follow. And what are you looking for? Well, where are you staying? Come and you will see. And this is the greatest invitation. This is the greatest blessing that we have been given. A blessing, an opportunity, the privilege to follow in wonder. And to make this blessing, he makes this blessing available to all who will accept that invitation. To all who are going to join him. To all who will come. To all who will come and follow and, and discover and Jesus has bridged a gap here. He has bridged a gap between us and a holy God by defeating all strongholds and all powers, all those things that get in the way sometimes between us and God. He's removed that already. And he has made it so that we can be united with God in, through a relationship that is deeply and intimately personal. Come and you will see. And the invitation, it's to follow. And what does it look like? Because the invitation is made to everyone. It is, it is open to everyone. Here's a little story, and it's called Table for Two. And the story is set in a, in a nice, quaint little restaurant, yet elegant. And there is this well-dressed man who's sitting at this table set for two, and he's sitting there at this table by himself. And the establishment that this is set in is, a, is, is one that this man is familiar with. He's been there before, and he's so familiar with the place that he even knows several of the staff by name. And a waiter comes by his side, comes to his table, and he asks him, Sir, would you like to go ahead and order now? You've been here for nearly a half hour. And with a soft smile, the man replies, No, that's fine. I'm going to wait for her a little while longer. But what I will have is I'll have a little more coffee. And so with that, the waiter pours him a little bit of coffee. And the man sits there alone, and his deep brown eyes are gazing through that 
floral centerpiece that's in the middle of his table, and he plays with his napkin a little while, and he, and he, he allows the, the light sounds of, of chatter and the, and the tinkling of silverware and the soft jazz music in the background just to fill his mind. And he's dressed well. He looks good. And yet he's not so formal as to make someone feel uncomfortable. And you get the sense that he wants his dinner companion to feel important, to feel respected, and to feel loved. And in time, as the evening moves on, the waiter comes by his table again, and he asks, is there anything else I can get for you, sir? No, thank you. That's fine. But this time, the, the waiter is unable to leave the man's side. He's not able to leave so quickly from the man's table, and his curiosity is tugging that hard at his heart. And he asks, and he's hoping that his question is not going to be a question that oversteps any boundaries. And he says, Sir, I don't mean to pry, but may I ask you something? And the man says, It's fine. Go ahead. Sir, why do you bother waiting for her? And his response is, Because she needs me. That answer didn't seem to settle well or sit well with this waiter. And he says, but are you sure? Because it seems to me that if she needs you, she really isn't showing that. She isn't, she isn't showing that she does. She stood you up now for the third time this week. And that's just this week. What about last week? And with that comment, the man winced. And he says, yes, I know. But she said that she would be here tonight. And so I'm waiting. And so the waiter nods and he turns away and he walks away. And he's wondering how... How a man could love a girl who stands him up three times a week. And he goes to the, to the end of the, or to the, to the far end of the room and he observes the man sitting by himself. And he just observes him. And his heart is going out to him. And he just watches him as he's gently stirring his coffee, taking several sips. And he wonders to himself, perhaps this girl has more qualities than I'm aware of. Maybe there's something that I'm just not seeing or that I just don't know. Because that man seems nice. He seems compassionate. He seems stable and kind, and respectful. Well, at around 9.30 p.m., the man gets up from his table, and he begins to make his way, make his way out of the restaurant. He pays his bill, and he leaves a tip, and, and he walks to the door, and as he passes by the waiter, the waiter says, Sir, it was nice having you with us. I look forward to seeing you again soon. 7 o'clock tomorrow night. And the man nods and smiles. But his smile could not hide the hurt that was so evident within his eyes. And out he goes. And the waiter in his mind, he cries out, Lady, who are you and why do you not join the one who loves you at a table set for two? The invitation to come and see is to join with Jesus and it's to walk with him and to follow him. And to follow him is to be convinced that what really matters to Jesus ought to really matter to us then too. It ought to compel us to behave and act as Jesus would act among us, as he had. And to say that, that I believe in Jesus and that I believe that his love will change me and that it can change the world, to say that and then not to live out the love of God or to pick and choose in, in the ways in which I'm going to do that or to, or to whom I'm going to show love to and to whom I will not, I've missed what matters to God. I've not really accepted the invitation then. I've not really accepted the invitation to join him at a table for two, where he has, that he has invited me to share and join with him in. And why refuse? Why refuse the offer to come and see? And do we believe that our refusal, our refusal to follow, it, that it might even be hurtful? And can you hear the words of Micah that had also been read for us this morning? Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. And is it possible, is it possible that there have been moments where we have held back from God? Perhaps there were moments where we were sure of what God would have wanted for us. And perhaps there were moments, something that, that should have been done that we left undone. Or possibly where we withheld grace and mercy, love and compassion that we should have extended, but we didn't do it for whatever reason be it that we're stubborn, being that we're afraid, whatever it might be, or were there times where we knew that within our very own lives that something was not right, but we refused to bend or to give up whatever it was. 
the invitation to come and see what God will do in and through you to follow. You know, it's really nice. It's a nice invitation until faced with the hard reality that something is required. And until we take notice of it, it will be like refusing to sit at a table for two, where we really do join our hands with his, where, where our hearts really are joined with his heart. And when asked, why? What have I done that you would refuse this offer? Why won't you sit with me? What answer will be found? And in Micah, the prophet, as he writes, he shows that an answer for this is very hard to find when being asked several questions as such from a holy God, from a perfect God. And he expresses it, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come with burnt offerings? With calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit for the sin of my soul? The people of Micah's era, it was their time to respond to God's complaint. What have I done? But they have nothing to say in light of God's pressing questions. And, and what did God want from them? Well, if we're familiar with some of the Old Testament times, with some of, with some of that in, in their world, it was a world that, was, that, had, that had a lot to do with, with sacrificial systems, like animal sacrifices and the like. And, and what we can come, what we, where we can come, or what we find in Micah uh, specifically, is that God isn't interested in any of that from his responses here. He wasn't asking of them or looking for a specific type of offering from them. He was wanting a specific type of person. Come and see and follow where they would discover how blessed and how loved they are by God. And when they understand that a holy God who created them and who loved them and who cared for them pursues them, and to find this holy God and be filled with that kind of love, it will shine out from them. That's what God is wanting. And the spirit of Jesus will then be in them and will flow out from them. And then the Micah passage, it culminates with this big answer. And it may not be the answer that the people were looking for or even what they were seeking. And it wasn't about systems of sacrifice. God requires something. God does require something else when accepting his offer to be in his presence. And their emphasis, their emphasis was sacrificial worship to the exclusion of what matters to God. And God clarifies what is good. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. And now the clarification has been given and now the more difficult task is to live within these requirements as God's people. And why does this matter so much? Why does it matter? Well, the simple answer to that is because God loves all people and he works and works to draw all people to himself. And he looks to his church, his people, and he blesses them. He blesses them in every conceivable way. Blessings without limit. And there's no status required, as Paul so emphatically implies in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We are blessed because God made it so. We are blessed because of Jesus, because of his love and of his mercy, because of his sacrifice so that all blessings are ours. And the main one would be that we would know God and that we would know that we are loved by God without limit. And when we accept this invitation, we come. We come as we are. And he receives us. And he will do greater things in our lives that, that we might not have been prepared for, where he will shape us and where he will mold us like a piece of clay. People who live best he forms us into the people that he knows is best, who do justice, who love kindness and mercy, who walk humbly, who walk humbly and, and ever closely with God, the creator of our souls. And so the invitation, will you join him? Will you join him at the table that he has set for you? Because the invitation is always open at a table set for two. And the church, the people of God, you and I are the salt of the earth the light of the world. So let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your, to your Father who is in heaven. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together. And what I'm going to ask for us to do, I know there's no songs that are listed there. We're going to sing the very first verse of probably one of the most famous songs that has ever been written. 
We knew it when we were little, and we know it now. The first verse of Jesus loves me. Let's sing together.